Welcome into Other People's Shoes. I'm your host, Neil. And today I sit down with another one of our uh, youth from back in the day. This youth's name is Kyle. And Kyle has a very fascinating story on how he did not grow up in the church and how he had every reason in the world probably to reject church and to have nothing to do with God. But he has an amazing story of why he chose to be a part of what he is now a part of and how his story of faith has uh, been a part of his life for so long now. Fascinating story. Hope you're ready for it because you know I am. Here we go. Hey, come take a walk with me. Not like you used to do. Do something different and put yourself in other people's shoes. Open up your mind and open up your eyes and Change your direction, change your perspective. Welcome into Other People's Shoes. I'm your host, Neil, and I get the privilege again of talking with one of my youth kids. Now, some of you who have listened to some of these previous episodes might notice we have yet to have a girl on. Now, that's not foreshadowing to say that this next person is a girl, but I promise we, we do have some girls uh, in the wings. Uh, I'm just getting to maybe we're, we're going boys first and then the girls. That, that's a good way to look at it, maybe. I, I'm not sure, but I want you to welcome in my next guest. His name is Kyle Rollins. I'm going to give your full name only because we're going to talk about something towards the end, so stay tuned for that. But, Kyle, uh, how are you? Life is good. Good. So we're going to be talking about some cool stuff today. Um, So I want you to, if you can, jump in the time machine with me back to when you first started going to junior high and high school Mm -hmm. during that time frame and your youth group experience. Okay. So if you can kind of take that time machine with me, go back in time then. Totally. And uh, are you there? I am. Okay. That was a quick trip. (laughs) Yeah. So I, I, I say this, Kyle and I, have, I, I would say relatively have stayed pretty close through the years. We've, yeah. we've crossed past a time or two. He's, he's bailed me out with some band stuff, and you are mm-hmm. in a band. and Kind of, yeah. Yeah, kind of, yeah. yeah. All right. And then you, you're doing some, some cool stuff in your job, and we'll, again, we'll, we'll mm-hmm. talk about that. But, but think back, when was the first time you started coming to church, youth group, and, and how old were you? Do you remember? I do. I was... I was 14. It was probably the middle of my freshman year of high school. Okay. Yeah. And um, how old are you now? Just I am 32. Put it in perspective. Going on 32 and a half. 32 and a half. Old enough <laughs> to have acne and gray hair. <laughs> so I'm in that perfect that's, awkward stage. That's hilarious. Okay. Yes. 32 and a half. <laughs> I love that. So, so obviously some time has passed. A little bit. A little bit of time. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough to say. All right. So uh, back then, again, uh, thinking back to that, uh, what was one thing that you learned back then that, that maybe you still use today? Was there one thing or maybe an accumulation of things that, that you remember? Um, oh, yeah. No, definitely. There's lots of things that I learned from that era of my time. Good good word. I like that. Good yeah. era. Okay. Yeah. yeah the, that, the era of your time. Okay. There was definitely, um, definitely, because that was coming out of a place of doing a lot of stupid things just for the sake of doing stupid things like any teenage boy does. And, uh, I actually had enough, I don't know, of God's grace sitting on me to say, Hey, look, here's what this looks like in 20 years. Do you want that? And then no, no, I really don't. So I kind of shifted gears and turned down the side road and I was like, well, what's this church thing all about? And looking into that and the more and more I look into it the more and more I go yeah definitely definitely the right call so do you recall like that first experience like who did someone invite you how how did you find out about what we were doing in those youth days so it was kind of a it was always like in the outlier of my sphere of people that influenced me because um I don't know if you've made mention to him in the past, but uh, John and Catherine Sleppy. I haven't, not yet. But uh, they have not come up yet. You're the first. Cool. Yeah. But, they, but you had you had some interaction. I with them. definitely did. Yeah. My um, way back in the day, like probably five years before I was even in high school, my friend's sister was babysitting their niece, and my and John. I think, I think we're following that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My niece's cousin's uncle's nephew. Right. Yeah. It was kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. So my my really good friend's sister was watching their niece and for the 
people listening who don't know, John and Catherine Sleppy were also youth leaders at the same time that Neil Matthews is also one of my youth leaders. And um, they also, John had a music store across the parking lot from my mom's work where I actually used to go and steal drumsticks and guitar strings. Did you ever get caught? Just on a little side note. He never did. At least he never confronted us, my brother and I, but I've, or, yeah, he must have known. Okay. <laughs> and All I, right. I have since confessed. Some some him. extra grace yes. there. Yes. Maybe even paid some drumsticks back. Are you paying some, uh, uh, what is it, restitution? <laughs> That's what I was looking for. It, he was very, very merciful. In, nice. <laughs> in, okay. John yeah. is a great guy. Yeah. And no, John and Catherine haven't come up yet, but, yeah, but I'm yeah. glad you're talking about Yeah, so, definitely. So that's how you kind of got connected. Was kinda, through that kind of influence? So they were always kind of in, in, in the influence. Uh, Catherine actually watched my younger sisters. They were babysitters from like time I was 11, 10 on, but mainly what actually got me involved in the youth group was, uh, just my circle of friends. Some of my friends that I hung out with were doing this thing on Wednesday nights where they'd go and hang out with a bunch of other high school kids. And I figured, eh, it beats going home and play video games. I'll have to go do something. Now help me out. John and Catherine would, would even go around and pick kids up. Oh yeah. They, they had a van, a, a good size. It wasn't like a new van, but, oh, a, but goodness, no. but a, but a pretty beat up old van. Yep. Uh, I, I don't want to say any kind of creeper connotations, but, no, but no, it wasn't no. that at all. No, but, but they would go around and pick kids up totally. and that's kind of how you got to, uh, in those days, I think it was a Friday night youth group. Right. And then, yeah. and then you transitioned into a high school youth group on Wednesdays. Yeah. It was Is that your memory or? Kind of, like I, a lot of my friends went to the Friday night thing. I went maybe once, maybe twice. And, um, but yeah, John and Catherine in that blue Dodge Ram 15 passenger van that, yeah, they'd go around and pick kids up and just heart for kids, take them out yeah. to a park and play and have a message and all that stuff. And so I went to that maybe once or twice, but I didn't really, it was just kind of an offhand thing that I went on the rare occasion and in high school is definitely when I started going, I was like, Oh yeah, no, this is, this is the thing that's fun that I enjoy doing. You were more active come high school. Much, okay. much more active. Okay. And I didn't remember that. I mean, right. I knew there was a John and Catherine influence and kind right. of that's how you may have gotten, uh, in a sense invited, mm-hmm. but I didn't know your, your activeness didn't really take off till, till high yeah. school. So that's, that's good. I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> silly question, but, but, but uh, maybe a relevant one. Mm-hmm. Do you ever really remember making a decision for Jesus? And, and what did that look like? Um, yeah, I did. And it was towards the end of my freshman year. And so my typical, I don't know if you were fully aware of this, but most of the people that I hung out with in high school, especially my freshman year, our typical Friday night was we would all have saved a bunch of money and we'd go to one of our friend's houses and give his mom all of our money and she would use that money to go buy as much malt liquor as she could and then we would no i'm not aware of this keep going yeah Yeah. uh, now i'm intrigued right yeah and so typical friday night we'd go get a whole bunch of malt liquor old english let's not name the mom by the way (laughs) nope nope (laughs) nope or the friend and or the friend yeah and uh names will be unnamed unless for good reasons yes but anyway (laughs) uh yeah we would uh do that we drink pretty heavily and then go to the local punk rock heavy metal show and do that and sometimes we would end up driving around stealing lawn ornaments and moving polit- political signs from yard to yard and just doing mischievous things and it was like i mentioned earlier that was kind of the path that i was on that i was like hey yeah and then i got some foreshadowing of this is what this looks like for 25 years down the road that you're going to be an adult without without peers and you're going to be buying children alcohol just because you need fellowship of some sort and i was like yeah i don't necessarily think this is going to be a productive road and uh so i started shifting gears and found i was like okay this is like guilt-free fun so and it was about it was actually the weekend before easter that we had a real big, big night of drinking and partying. And and then the next morning I woke up and got a ride home where I piled into the Lincoln Mark 7, the four four passenger car that my mom had with all four of my siblings. And we drove several hours to go meet family for Easter. And uh, I was like, this sucks. This is no fun being in the backseat with little kids and 
and not feeling well because of all of the drinking. And I was like, yeah, I need to make a change now. And then I was like, well, I've got this Jesus thing that seems to make sense a little bit. Let's, I'm going to explore that route and just kind of go down this path. And it was, yeah, Easter of, what would that be, 2000? That, yeah. So you made the decision basically on your own. No no spiritual guide, no no person with you to, to pray that prayer, so to speak, of of repentance and Jesus come into my heart. Nothing, no choir, no church setting, just literally in the back of your mom's car saying, Jesus, I need you come into my life kind of thing. Kind of, yeah. It was more like, okay. And it wasn't really a fully like, I'm sold for Jesus. It was like, oh, let's explore this Jesus thing. It seems to have some have some good foundation. And then, and then there was definitely prayers almost every single time we met on Wednesday night of hey look let's let's get together and let's actually like repent of things that we did wrong and anybody knows everybody has some form of moral law where they recognize right and wrong and anybody who denies that steal their car and then talk with them and they will definitely tell you that there's a right and wrong but anyway uh, yeah it was there was definitely lots of that coming through the year of like, hey, repent. And I was like, yeah, okay. And then it was kind of like on Easter, I was like, okay, yeah, no, I need to change. Something needs to shift. This isn't going to equal anything good. And then, so yeah, when I tell people that I got clean and sober when I was 15, they they can go, ha, ha, yeah. And then I go, no, for real. <laughs> I got clean and sober when I was 15. And uh, yeah. That's that's a great testament yeah. to, to recognize that even at 15. I don't think there's a lot of 15-year-olds, in my opinion, that uh, maybe would make that conscious choice to make that change, that dramatic of a change. So, yeah. so that's that's really a testament to to perhaps your faith and, and where that goes, and not perhaps, but your faith in that. So, mm-hmm. okay. So, uh, again, going back to that youth time frame, maybe high mm-hmm. school time frame, youth group area, um, what kept you coming? What, um, what are the things that that really just, I mean, because you have, uh, even at that age, I mean, uh, granted, now, Kyle, I, I know you said your your age at the onset, but things have changed dramatically. Oh, much. Since the time you were a high schooler. Oh, to my gosh, now, yes. right? There's Facebook, there's Instagram, there's all this crazy stuff, yeah. but th- there's so much stuff buying, in my opinion, so much buying uh, for kids' attention, especially young people. Mm-hmm. What kept you coming even in those days, because you could have gone any other direction. I mean, you mentioned oh, yeah. some punk rock shows. You mentioned hanging out with friends. You mentioned all this other oh, yeah. stuff. But what, you know, what really kept you going in those days? It was, it was honestly the, the more and more I looked into, the Word and the Bible, the less and less I could really see, see like fault in it. And it's like. Yeah, I recognize people are broken. People are always going to fail. But the more and more I studied the doctrine and, like, the heart of what I believed was behind it, the better I felt. I never had any guilt because of going to church, even though people tried. And I was like, no, I, my God, this God that I'm reading about is a, is a loving, caring God. Why would I ever be ashamed or guilty of that? And so I started looking in, into that. And also, it was a lot of, we had a lot of fun. We had a ton of fun with a, a decent sized youth group of regularly 20 kids or plus that became just good close friends and it was kind of just having good fellowship that was guilt free and just good fun was, yeah so <clears throat> you kind of went through the the church through your high school days mm-hmm. and um did you ever stop at any point going to church or did you just kind of continue that uh, activity and that uh, attendance and that you know all that post high school. Uh, post high school, I actually kept coming. Um, my thing for me is that I, by the time I was, I graduated as a high school senior, I recognized I was like, oh no, God is definitely. He has a much better plan than anything I could ever come up with, and like, I had a job that allowed me to get to church on Sunday morning, and there wasn't a whole lot of. Uh, stuff for an 18 year old to do as far as like it wasn't considered youth and there wasn't really a young adults kind of thing going on but I still I was still friends with everybody so I'd still hang out when I could and and I knew that God had a better plan for me than anything I could come up with so let's just keep going to church and uh so I yeah I kept coming through 
Now, help, help me out, because I remember a little bit of your parents. Mm-hmm. Were they church people? Did they did they no. go to the church with you? Did they <laughs> make you go to the church? Did they no. do anything creative like that to say, Kyle, you have to go? No, absolutely not. Actually, there were times where it was the opposite, <laughs> where my mom's like, you're grounded from church. Why? Because I don't want you to go. You don't have a good reason for me not to go to church. Yeah. So if, if anything, the closest religion my mom would probably consider herself, I would probably guess Wiccan. And then my dad, he actually grew up fairly devout Mormon. Now, I did remember that. Yeah. I did remember that. And part, as, yeah. as a young kid from like 7, 8 until about 10 or 11, my brother and I, my parents sent us to the Mormon church. So I kind of grew up in that. And then that always, for whatever reason, felt awkward going to a Mormon church for me. Um, the people were wonderful, very nice, very caring, very giving. But just the vibe in the church never really set well with me. And it was... It was just awkward. Awkward is probably the best word for it. Sure. And um, so, yeah, my brother and I. But, yeah, and my dad grew up Mormon, definitely was not a practicing Mormon. Um, his, well, he had a bunch of sisters, and they were all, to some degree or whatnot, either following or not, the Mormon faith. And um, his parents were very devout and also very caring, giving, and loving. So that was I had some wonderful grandparents where I always kind of joke. And it's like, yeah, my, um, my dad's side of the family is Mormon and my mom's side of the family is moonshining rednecks. <laughs> 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 and, uh, there's a lot of truth to that. Wow. Yeah. What a, what an environment to, to come out of. And then, uh, to have the experience you had, you mm-hmm. know, in, in evangelical Christianity and, and becoming a disciple of Jesus. That's yeah. wow. That that's again, great testimony on that. So um, we'll, we'll get into some some more nitty, nitty gritty stuff here now. Uh, do you feel like any any youth leaders failed you at any point in time during those adolescent years or you know high school growing years? Do do you feel like there was any leader? And and you don't have to name names. I mean, right. you you can if you want, but um, uh, but I mean, do you feel like anybody failed you? No, I, or I even failed say, in your development? No, I wouldn't say that anybody failed me in the. No, and they were always there when I needed them. Um, if anything failed, it was my reaching out when I needed help. But I, that's just my, it's kind of how I'm hardwired. I don't really reach out because I try to jump into things head first and just figure things out. And um, I wouldn't say, I would definitely would not say that any of them failed me because that's, that's a big, it's a big harsh word. And, but no, definitely nobody failed me. Okay. So likewise, if the leadership didn't fail you, do you feel like the church as a whole s- failed in any way in, in not helping you develop or anything like that? I mean, do you feel like um, that at all? So in retrospect, looking back on it now and looking back on what I see church doing now and like church culture and having a smidgen of maturity, that granted, it's, it's not much, but um looking back I think the one thing because I eventually ended up becoming youth leader and did that for about a decade and um, the one thing that I would have done differently is create a culture of discipleship to where it's much more one on one like learning and asking more questions of what are you going through how are you dealing with this and just listening more to the to the youth that I dealt with. I would have done much more listening and asking questions that are just, how are you dealing with? And instead of giving a list of rights and wrongs, if that makes sense. You know, it does. And, and I, I'm glad you brought that up because, um, you know, being that you were the former youth and, and even now, I mean, I'm 38, hard to articulate that even sometimes, but, <clears throat> but thinking back to that, you know, as one of the main youth leaders, you know, I don't think we did a lot of discipleship. I don't think we did a lot of discipling. And <clears throat> and that's what, kind of where this, this uh, premise comes out of, this idea of people mm-hmm. leaving the church, is it comes out of this Barna Group study. They did a five-year study, and they compiled it in this book called You Lost Me. And in this study, it's a fascinating study of why kids leave. And we're going to get into that a little more. I, I just want to mm-hmm. kind of just re- refresh that a little bit. Yeah. 
but but that is uh that's kind of kind of where we're after so um so it sounds like we you know we the collective we back in those days could have mm-hmm. done a better job with that. I mean, is that, is that safe to say with, I mean, you're not yeah. attacking anybody. No, no, means, I think, but, I mean, abs- absolutely. and I don't think you are. Yeah. I, I think it's just a criticism of, or a, at least some feedback of where we were. Of course, we, none of us can jump in a DeLorean and, you know, go back in time and change yeah. it. But going forward now, you know, being right. more conscious of absolutely. that, which is where I'm after. So exactly. Okay. So with, with that being said, some more, um, looking back again, I, I don't know. I love to look back just to smile and, and think, but then obviously try not to dwell there, but, right. but move forward. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so forgive all these, uh, looking back questions, but, but again, good. looking back, um, greatest moment you had and, and maybe least favorite moment you had. Gosh, A greatest moment as far as Youth group? Just, yeah, youth group. Or, youth group. Yeah. There's a lot of good moments. I know. If you could there narrow it down to one, God. maybe two, I know I'm... Uh, there, there was a lot of good moments. There were there were a couple of, like, heated moments, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, anytime you get yeah. young people together. Oh, man. Hormones raging. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and there was... Uh, gosh. I'd probably say one of my favorite moments is actually one that probably necessarily wasn't the a good moment, but it was definitely a fun moment, which was, uh, just pranks at summer camp. Yeah. And there was, there's several of those. Those are yep. probably stories they tell more than anything. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and being guilty of that as a leader and helping in those pranks. Yep. yep. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, yeah. I do look back on those as well. Yeah, yeah. There, there was a, there was a lot of really good fun, fun times doing that. There was also some good, real good heart to hearts with just, buddies and it's like how are you dealing with this like what's going on and it's like mm, some of the kids in our youth group they were they were put through the ringer pretty hard like with their home life and, yeah and uh just seeing how they came out and managed it was it was impressive to kind of see and having that and then yeah but i'd say probably one of the most heated quote-unquote negatives would probably be we were down in vallejo <laughs> at a, uh, I know where you're talking yeah, about. Yep. Yeah, yeah. We were at, you... we were at Terra Hills Alliance. Yes, Church, yes. And we were playing a game called Disfellowship. Disfellowship. It's also called Mafia. Mafia. Yes. But in our church, <laughs> we had people who had uh, apparently relatives or some kind of mafia tie. I don't recall exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> but excuse me, we we were not. We were no longer. We were asked to no longer call it Mafia. We could keep the game, but we had to change right. the name. So us as leadership came up with a way to call it disfellowship. Yeah. Same game. Same we game, just, same principles, just, we just different language. Change, change the names. And so, yeah, talk and, about that. Yeah. I, and, I don't want to steal your and, thunder on that. And but it's, but uh, yeah, that, and, that was a good moment. In concept, it's a, it's a great game and it's a great role playing game where you got to get into character and you got to learn how to, to skillfully use your words to create an outcome. And, and, a lot of times, us being teenagers, we would, especially some of the guys, we would kind of pick on some people. And like any teenage boy, you see a button, you just keep push, 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 push. And some some of the other youth and so, who are dear friends, I look at like family now, um, One of, a couple of the girls got really, really upset. And, it, and emotions really, really got ramped up. And it was not a healthy environment it was it was there was some screaming there was some yelling there was some and it transferred over tears and, there yeah, a lot, a of, lot tears. of tears a lot of tears yep. and um yeah that was that would probably be P- people in separate rooms that night yeah. in more ways than one yeah. a lot of yelling yep yeah and it, there was yep. and it all stemmed from just a Stupid game simple, of this <laughs> <laughs> simple game and yeah so that yeah. was that was probably one of the negatives and and we're laughing because it's fun to look back and laugh. It is, and it's like at the time we were not oh laughing. Man, I want to be clear on just, that. I was no. even as the leader being asked to task to to manage this group of you know young people. I, yeah. I, there was no laughter in my in my uh, in my thought process back then. Right, I do right. remember that night. Definitely, yeah. and like look, I'm glad you're bringing it up because it did bring back a fun memory. It did, and as it's far like, as just even, how riled up people got. Exactly, and it's like even though it's quote unquote a negative experience, looking back, it was like definitely a learning experience and, <laughs> it really was and uh and we all it's what's the point of having bad things if you don't learn from them right so yeah it was it was 
fun and kind of like, oh, we might not want to play this game. For I don't a while. think we played it much after <laughs> that. Not. I don't recall, we but did I, not. I might be wrong on that. But and, yeah, but Kyle, I know you, you and uh, your lovely bride mm-hmm. have had children come through your home yeah. through the the foster care system. Is my understanding um, right? Yeah, most recently through the foster care system, but okay. mostly through youth being a youth leader. Okay, mm-hmm. so that's awesome. So obviously, with that. What would you tell your kids about youth? Because most of them have been adolescents, right? As you as you kind of alluded to, most mm-hmm. of them have been youth age or high school of age. Yeah. What uh, what message would you tell them about church going forward? Because again, this Barner group believes that there's such a drop off post high school, post twenties. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's just uh, by some standards would even be considered an epidemic in in church existence. Right Absolutely. Now, yeah. Especially the evangelical movement. So, what are you telling your not only your youth that that you work with or mm-hmm. that you have worked with previously, but but then the kids that you've had the power of of influence over. Yeah. Um, as far as a foster parent power, right, of right, right. Just yeah. to clear on that. And yeah, like, yeah. You're not brainwashing kids. No, definitely not. And it's again, a lot of it is just listening, to hearing what they have going on, questions, concerns, and, and then trying to go to the scriptures and say, "Here, look, this is what this says about it," and also different books because I believe every everybody's kind of hardwired slightly differently. So they're more receptive to different types of response. And, but, uh, the, the first and foremost is there is a God up there and he does love you more than anything else ever. And that there's kind of three B's is the way I look at it. And that's, uh, behavior, belief and belonging. And the world economy operates in those, in that order. That if you behave the same way we do, we'll let you into our circle. That if we see that you believe what we believe too, then you can belong with us. And deep down, everybody's looking for some form of belonging, some form of comfort. And a lot of that is through, like, oh, man, you look at any Facebook ads or anything, just constantly pounding down your throat hey if you wear these new nikes and you act this way and you believe these things and yeah you can have belonging with us you look at any political party then it's like they're constantly like hey if you behave this way you believe this way then we get belonging you can have fellowship you can have that belonging and and the one thing that jesus does completely opposite is hey look i made you and i love you you already have belonging with me because I love you more than anything this world can ever hold. And as a result of that belonging with Jesus and being made in his image, you you may stay you may start to change what you believe. And the more you get into that, and then you may start to change what you believe and as a result your behaviors will change. So God does it the complete backwards way. And ultimately, it's it's just that. That was awesome. So we're going to get into some uh, some reasons. So these are the six reasons the Barna Group has discovered why people leave. Okay. So I'm curious what you think. Agree, disagree, and then if you want to respond, mm-hmm. if you want. Okay. So no particular order. Uh, reason number one. Even though they are listed in one through six, we're just going to say there's no particular order to these. Mm-hmm. I mean, there may be a greater reason or whatever. Anyway, yeah. here we go. So church seems overprotective. Agree or disagree? Uh, I can see how that, yeah, I can see how they can say that. So I can, I get the understanding of where they're coming from. Would you agree with that at times? The church seems overprotective? Kind of, yeah. Okay. Especially yeah. at that, you know, you know, high school, 20-something age, Mm-hmm. You know, church seems a little overprotective. Okay, so. Oh, actually, so that brings me back to another thing to backtrack a little bit. Is yeah. The being overprotective is saying, it, I hearken that back to like, here's a list of do's and don'ts without giving you any background as to why. And so they're constantly trying to shelter people and shelter kids. It's like, don't do this, don't do this. And they never figure out why until they're adults. And then they go out and do it. And they go, oh, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Reason number two. Teens and 20-somethings' experience of Christianity is shallow. I would, yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. Okay. How and, so? Um, again, it's taught, 
it's it's Jesus from a book instead of Jesus in your life. And it's a lack of discipleship and a lack of pouring true meaning in, into somebody's life through relationship. Say that phrase again. Which one? The one that you said Jesus from a book? Yeah, Jesus from a book instead of Jesus in your life. I like that. Okay. I like that a lot, actually. Um, okay, number three. Uh, church come a, comes across as antagonistic to science. Yeah, it, it, it does. There's there's a battle that's out there waging that science and religion are opposing forces, and they're not. It's like cooking versus music. How, it's They're totally different entities, and they not one is any better than any, the other. And, yeah, I, yeah. Okay, so you you agree with that as well? There, there that is that's a, a good reason why why people would leave. Okay, I, I I don't know if it's a good reason, but it's well, definitely a reason. A reason, <laughs> not not necessarily good or bad, but yeah. but a reason, like you said, I like mm-hmm. that too. <clears throat> okay, young Christians, church experience related to sexuality are often simplistic and judgmental. Yeah, I've seen that. Yep. Yeah, so if somebody is struggling with their perhaps their sexual orientation or their sexual preference or whatever, that the church is very simplistic in that regard and obviously very judgmental. You've seen that firsthand? Mm hmm. Okay. Do you have an experience? With, not you personally have an experience with that, obviously, but. Just, just in regards of how I've seen certain pastors, and I've been to several different churches up and down the West Coast and in Colorado and all that stuff, and, and of churches harping on a single issue and forgetting that it's all in love regardless of who did what sin we're called to love people right okay and so i've I've seen that okay yeah nice you have some experience with that okay Mm -hmm. so again that's another reason why people say that they leave is because of that reason so Mm -hmm. uh number five uh wrestling with the exclusivity exclusive nature of christianity in other words Jesus said, and I'll quote him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's pretty exclusive. Mm-hmm. And so that's one of the reasons why people say that they're leaving is because you know, there's got to be multiple paths to, to get to heaven. Right. Uh, do you agree with that or not? I, I definitely see that as a trend that's happening. And for me, truth in and of itself, in essence, is exclusory. It is exclusive. Truth is regardless of what anybody says about it. It is and if, yeah, if Jesus is true and he is the way, the truth, and the light, and nobody get through, get to heaven except through him, and that is a true statement, then yes, that is exclusive. And some people have a hard time with that. Yeah. Uh, number six, final one. Um, again, this is a Barna Group study, Six Reasons Why Young People Leave Church. Uh, number six, church feels, and this is the one that I really think is a hot button, more, more so than, than number four. Uh, number six is church feels unfriendly to those who doubt. I comment yeah, on that. I can say that. Yeah. And this is probably one of the things that I am guilty of. And well, it's not probably, it is one of the things I'm guilty of instead of saying, okay, yeah, people have doubts. Everybody has doubts. And, and just exploring that. Okay. You have doubt. I mean, Let's look into it, and instead of just accepting people that, yeah, you have doubts, but I'm still going to love you. I'm still going to give you me and disciple you through whatever doubt you may have. That's a lot of, uh, oh, you have doubt? We need to fix that. We need to fix that now. And it's like, let's, well, what are you doubting on? Here's A, B, and C reason why you shouldn't doubt. Instead of like, oh, no, there's, I can understand where you're coming from. It becomes... I need to fix this problem now instead of just, oh, I need to actually kind of hear where you're coming from and just sit there and be with it and let God kind of deal with it. And if that makes sense. I think it does. And, um, and, and Kyle, I just want to say you've given some great insight today. And so I'm re- I was really excited that we were going to get an opportunity to meet together because again, Kyle, you're one of those youth kids that, that, Back in the day, again, we're flashing back, but no matter what we asked, no matter if it was a service project, no matter if it was a task, no matter if it was a, you know, hey, we need this done or or we need this participation at this fundraiser or or whatever it may be, 
you were always one of the first ones to jump in, do it. And um, I, I just always, 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 always respected that and just, uh, you know, carried so much value for you in those days. And even now, because, you know, by statistically speaking, you shouldn't be where you are. No. Have you thought back to that? Like statistically speaking, you should not be where you are. And, and you're a business owner now. Mm -hmm. So talk about that because that is, that to me is, is the most greatest testimony for you is because, I mean, you really had every reason in the world against you considering your environment and everything you came out of, but to be where you are now, to have a great marriage, to have, you know, this great practice that you have. So, so speak to that. I I don't want to take over on that. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, what I do now is I'm, as far as how I make money is I'm certified Rolfer and massage therapist and people understand. I got to jump in. I don't even know what that is sometimes. So help, it, help, help me exactly. and help others understand what that is. Break exactly. that down for me. Yeah. So, um, the easiest way that I can explain Rolfing is it kind of bridges the gap between massage and chiropractics. So, and I'll make a short story really long for you, but no, I'm just kidding. But, uh, so when I graduated high school, I took a job make just so I can make money and, actually be an adult and I worked for a beverage distributor for like four years while going to school part-time because I wanted to get a job in the medical field somewhere because I had a knack for anatomy I really like really like anatomy and so I started taking classes towards a degree in pre-professional medicine with a long-term goal of being a physical therapist now after four years of working for a beer and wine distributor I took the opportunity to teach water aerobics at a hospital, which did that for... With old people? Yes. Okay. Probably one of my favorite jobs I've ever had, to be completely honest. It was a ball. And um, because I knew that I wanted to be in a medical environment because I enjoy that kind of field. And and I really liked physical therapy. I'd had a knee injury in high school that had to have surgically fixed and I went to physical therapy and I started looking at it going you know this is kind of a fun job I get to help people every day and 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 like deep down my passion is to help people in whatever fashion that is and to the point of moving enough people my first year out of high school I had to claim it on my taxes and it was that's awesome though yeah so I started working at this hospital teaching water aerobics they moved me into physical therapy where I was effectively just cleaning rooms and the grunt for the physical therapists for nine of them. And then, and then from there I took a job as a medical assistant at a private pain, chronic pain practice. And that doctor, he knew that to treat people's chronic pain, he had to do more than just stick them full of epidurals and give them pain meds. So he had hired an acupuncturist and counselor and a Oh gosh, chiropractor and a a guy who does this weird thing called rolfing. And so I was like, okay, whatever. And I started looking into it and everybody that was seeing this rolfer were coming back with better posture, more vitality, needing less medication to manage their pain. So I approached him one day and said, so what's it take to become this rolfer thing? And what all does it entail? And in looking at it, I was like, okay, so I can go down, continue down the path I'm on. And in, eight to ten years have a doctorate in physical therapy and be kind of a slave to insurance companies doing what they tell me to how they tell me to do it and then or i could kind of totally take this other path down becoming a certified rolfer and massage therapist and be able to truly work on people's issues that were there and it took significantly less time and significantly less debt and me not being the greatest student and being left to my own devices, I'm pretty lazy. I was like, two years versus 10 years? Yeah, I'll do this two-year thing. And so that was almost six years ago now when I finally graduated that. And uh, so I started helping people with their posture and their alignment through tissue manipulation. And, yeah. I got to say, since our last chat, <clears throat> um, way prior to the podcast, is the wallet thing. Cause I would always keep oh, my yeah, wallet yeah. in my back pocket yeah. and you kind of called me on that. Like, do mm-hmm. you always do that? And I was like, well, yeah, yeah, that's where my yeah. wallet goes. It goes in my back pocket. But since then, mm-hmm. 
I don't put it in my back pocket anymore. So it's nice. because of you. Hey, nice. I am losing my wallet a lot more, so my wife might not thank you for that. <laughs> but, but, but I did take your advice on that. And even awesome. today, as I sat down, if you notice, I took my wallet out oh, of my nice. pocket because I knew I was going to be sitting and I didn't want to sit on it. Nice. Even for this little bit of interview. So, Good call. So, so, Kyle, someone was interested in get, you know, looking into rolfing, seeing if that's something that, that would work for them, not only for their mm-hmm. body, but for their insurance and everything that comes with that. How can they get in touch with you? Um, right now, you can... I'm in the process of a rebranding, and everything is moving. And he up. has a new cool shirt, by the way. I do. So, and so what's the rebranding? The now? rebranding, my new business name is Body Right Studio. Okay. And there's a website in development that should be done by the end of January. Okay. And uh, it's called BodyRightStudio.com. And you can find me there. There's a Facebook page, Body Right Studio. And, uh, and it has all your contact and It has and all, all my that. contact info Perfect. there. And, uh, okay. Yeah. If you're interested, and if you're just interesting, and this is the first time you've ever heard of Rolfing, R-O-L-F-I-N-G, check out Rolf.org. Nice. And there's... Such a good radio voice, too, right. by the way. Thank you. <laughs> My mom always said I had a face for radio. So. <laughs> but, but, Kyle, here's the other thing, too, is, yep. is, is you're not... You're not giving me any money to oh, to, to be on on, on this, and, and and I'm not giving you any money to to say your stuff either. I, I always like to say that I'm not. No, sorry, dang it. Uh, <laughs> but I always like to say that because in my mind, I always want to help people, much like right. you. I want to help people get out. And and guys, he's a former youth kid. He's he's viable. He's not a kid anymore, by the way. He mentioned that at the onset of how old he is. But I am still childish, though. But you, you can are, ask my wife. You are. Yes, absolutely. You, in my mind, you'll always be 16. So we're gonna play. Uh, I got one last thing for you. So in honor of it being a you thing i thought we should play a game Sweet. Uh, i actually do this on every episode but but because of your youth kid if i can get my phone to open there we go um we're gonna play a game all right so here we go i got a dice here all right die i should say somebody corrected me are we once. playing dungeons and dragons we are not playing dungeons and dragons but i i do want you to look it is a it is a in north, north carolina, carolina cup. Tar Heel it has to be in north so. carolina i didn't wear any blue today so i had to bring the cup oh Where's my watch? Does have a little yeah. blue on it? But I'm gonna have you roll that, and then uh, what you roll will determine what question you get. Ooh, doom, doom, doom. And this is a game I like to call senseless. So let's see what you got. Four. You got to roll again. I mean, no. as much as I love four, everybody's oh. been getting fours, but that's fine. I'll do another one. All right. If you want. No, it's fine. okay. We'll find one more. I think James got a four. So <laughs> all right. I like to give a variety, but I like variety. So there we go. Ooh, you got two. a two. Nobody's gotten a Deuces. two yet. And this is perfect. This is a perfect. See, it's a good thing you rolled again when nice. you hear the question. So here it is. Uh, who's touching your life right now? Who's touching my life right now? I mean, the, the, of course, the easy answer is, oh, it's Jesus. But, but be, you know, I mean, well, outside of him. Yeah. Um, honestly, there's a couple of authors that I've been listening to lately. And the first one that comes to mind is actually a guy named Brennan Manning. Okay. What what is his book about? He's so got touching. He's got a couple of different books. Um, okay. One of them is the Ragamuffin Gospel, which is beautiful book if you've never read it. I, I haven't. And then the other one is Abba's Child, and Abba's Child is a book about talking about how we are just a child. We are a child of God, and we all have our follies. We all will fail, but deep down, our identity comes from God who knit us in our mother's womb, and that. We have an imposter self telling us, oh, we're not, we're not capable of doing this. We have a pharisaical self telling us that, oh, we're better than the next guy, when deep down, no, we're just children of God. And so Abba's Child in, from Brennan Manning is probably one of my go-tos. Like That one is almost always on the back of my mind. Got it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Kyle, again, thanks for coming on. Thanks for sharing some moments with us. You know, I I know you haven't left the church, and that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And that's awesome. mm -hmm. Um, And, and again, I I wish you all the best in your practice and and everything that comes with that. And, and of course, I I love your bride dearly. She's a sweet lady, too. Um, And, and again, um, I just... I can't say it enough how proud I am of where you are and and how excited I am of of this you know new transition that you're on and and I wish you all the best. So thank you very thanks much. Thanks for coming on. And guys, again, this is other people's shoes. Some things you heard today may not be what you love. It may not be some things you agree with, but see, that's the best part of life is when you walk in someone else's shoes, you really do get someone else's perspective. 
Thank you again for listening.